The lithium brine miners have an Achilles heel. Strategic advisor to Wealth Minerals, Tim McCutcheon, is going to explain. Tim, welcome to Kitco. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Wealth Minerals has lithium projects in South America. Big picture first, Tim, what struck you most about this recent run up in battery metals? You know, it, it's funny, the, the long term story uh, over the course of a decade hasn't really changed in the lithium space. Uh, so um, what it really is, is I think just it's, it's the availability of liquidity and in, in whatever invention, investor attention that happens to be at a particular time in the market cycle. So the recent run up uh, in lithium, if we talk about recent being in the past 24 months or so, um, has really been recovering from uh, essentially an, an inventory special situation that happened in the second half of 2018. Um, but in general, the run-up has been uh, the broader investor audience being aware of the fact that the consumption of lithium is very much with us, uh, that it is a, an important material uh, for all of the plans that we have for sort of future, you know, use of, uh, of renewable energy. And yet the supply of lithium to make all of that happen is it's got some serious issues that I'm sure we'll discuss. And so um, the theme is, is the same as it's always been. The world is moving towards uh, inventory management systems, aka batteries. Uh, those batteries require lithium. Uh, and as we move exponentially towards that kind of future, uh, the metals to make it happen aren't readily abundant uh, to do so. And so, you know, cobalt, lithium, graphite, all of these metals and other materials are, are always on the radar screen. It's just sometimes they sort of capture the, the attention of investors, sometimes they don't. Uh, let's do some introductions, uh, Tim. Uh, could you talk about who the principals are at uh, Wealth Minerals and what you're focused on? Yeah. So uh, Wealth Minerals, um, in our, in our, where we are now focused on the lithium space in Chile really be, uh, traces its, its origins back to 2015 when Hank Van Alphen, our current CEO, and a guy named Marcelo Awad, who is uh, the head of our office in Chile, uh, they got together. Uh, Hank has had a, a lot of work with uh, sort of a serial entrepreneur in the metals and mining space in Vancouver, uh, Trevali Metals, Corriente, Cardero. Uh, and Marcelo was the former CEO of Antofagasta, one of the world's largest copper miners, publicly listed on the London Stock Exchange, and he was executive VP of Cadelco for many years. So, you know, Marcelo is basically uh, very well connected and understands the Chilean mining space. Hank knows the capital markets and sort of how things work to incubate projects here out of Canada. And the two got together in the very end of 2015. I joined uh, sort of uh, in the second quarter of 2016 um, to really kind of... Uh, bring more of a day-to-day -day focus to what they're doing uh, and bigger picture focus. And uh, we quickly acquired a very large uh, land package in the Atacama Solar. For those in your audience who don't know, the Atacama Solar is the single largest brine project in production today. It represents about a quarter of the world's output. Uh, that is happening in the southern part of the Solar. We own our land package in the northern part of the Solar, where we hope to be developing it in the future. And again, we'll talk about that process, I'm sure, later in the interview. We also have another project uh, called Ayagwe, which is further north on the Bolivian border. Uh, and that project, it looks like it's going to pan out to be very comparable to some of our peer group companies in Argentina, whether it be, you know, Millennial that was bought out or Neolithium and that type of project and that scale of a vast now, also lithium uh, supply comes uh, from uh, solars, as you're noting, and uh, from evaporation. Uh, why do you think that uh, this technology has run its course? Yeah, uh, you know, number one, the, just conceptually, the idea of actively trying to get rid of water in the driest place on the planet is just nuts. <laughs> and in the past, when it was a very small sort of, you know, a, a small thing that was happening, no one really paid much attention to it because it wasn't such a big deal. As demand for lithium has grown uh, and it, sort of investor attention as well as sort of NGO attention as well as political attention has focused on this production process, the true nature of what's actually happening has sort of come, come out. And then, of course, people realize how sort of, you know, inefficient this is. Uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, you're sucking up salty water from underneath the earth. You're dumping it out into these very shallow ponds that you create. Uh, and then you let Mother Nature dry off the water to leave the residual salts that were in the water in the first place. Uh, and that's where your lithium is, it's basically in salts. Um, it's very cheap to do, makes a lot of sense, except that, again, you're using a, a resource in a part of the world where it's extremely scarce. And so to basically to do that, 
i.e. you basically try to get rid of water, uh, I don't think it's going to fly anymore. I think it's very clear from all the sounds that were made in um, uh, Argentina and particularly in Chile, uh, new permitting of uh, solar evaporation ponds uh, is probably over. In, in my opinion. Certainly in Chile, I don't think that's going to happen. Argentina, maybe one or two might slip through, but I would say in the next five years, we're going to see the end of solar evaporation as a production technique uh, in South America. Uh, let's, uh, go, uh, let's go big picture first, Tim, and then you could talk about uh, the other types of uh, lithium production they have, uh, mm -hmm. because there's, uh, there's, there's a hard rock, uh, there's clay, uh, but uh, also kind of what uh, Wealth Minerals uh, focused on that uh, was specific uh, for where you're working. Yeah, so um, there are two ways, basically, to get um, lithium out of brine without using solar evaporation. Number one is basically using solvents. Uh, basically, lithium comes out of the brine in the form of a salt, and you basically use chemicals to dissolve away that salt to recover the lithium. That presents a whole other host of problems, meaning that you have a bunch of you know chemicals that aren't exactly environmentally friendly lying around that you have to deal with and process and manage those properly. Um, it is a way to not do solar evaporation, but it kind of replaces one set of problems with another set of problems. The alternative way is using sorption technology, where it's more of a physical process as opposed to a chemical process, where a sorbent attracts out of the brine the lithium salts. Um, and that way, you're basically, when you complete that process cycle, you have the brine completely intact without the lithium in it. And you can then take that brine and put it back into the solar, basically re-inject it back into the solar. You might ask, why is that important? Well, if you think about what a solar is, it's basically, you know, the top layer is this dried salt lake bed. But underneath it is a super saturated sponge of salt and stuff uh, with, with water in it. Um, the water is your conveyor belt to get the salts to the surface. If there's no water, there's no conveyor belt, there's no resource. So, you know, if there's no water in a solar, you cannot recover the lithium out of that solar. There's no way to do it. Um, and so you need the water levels in the solar to remain constant and high. If by over exploiting that water and you bring that water table down, you run the risk of permanently ruining your resource. Um, and so that's the, the, the way to move forward seems very clear to everyone is pump the brines out, use a sorption technology process, and then what's ever remaining from that process, you inject back into the solar to maintain those water levels high. So that water then can re-dissolve re new lithium salt deposits that are trapped underground that can then be extracted later on as well. Now, that falls with under uh, direct lithium extraction. Is that uh, the correct as well, too? So now there's a couple of players in this area. So there's also developers and uh, there's also people that are offering uh, technology solutions. So I think of Energy X and then there's a Vulcan in Germany. There's uh, E3 in uh, Alberta, Lyra. which are looking at yeah. uh, DLE as well, too. Uh, Talk about uh, the technology solution that you looked at uh, with um, Wealth Minerals, um, why you decided to go with it and what the advantages are. Yeah, well, um, so I, I want to just one sort of thing very clear. There is an enormous amount of money being invested across the board, uh, Western Europe, the US, um, uh, Canada, uh, in terms of coming up with perfecting sorption technology uh, processes. Um, and there is no doubt in my mind that uh, there will be an incumbent technology that works and it's just fine, um, much like we have in any other uh, natural resource extraction uh, process, whether it be you know gold or copper or whatever it is. Um, so that doesn't necessarily concern me as, as you know as, as someone involved in, in, in the, the natural resource side of this business, the lithium business. Um, the the um, the original solution that we had was we signed an MOU with a company called Uranium One. And Uranium One has a sorption technology that has been in operation in Western China now for over a decade. Um, so we know it works uh, and they know it works. Uh, and Uranium One, uh, part of their deal with us was basically to use that technology uh, in cooperation with us as part of, you know, that was the, the added value, if you will, the reason why they wanted into our, our projects. Um, the, the, it's a manganese aluminum uh, a product. That, and what's clear to your, your viewers right now is that the sorption technology 
process has been known for decades. This is nothing really new. You can look up, you know, research papers from Berkeley uh, from 1990, and, and, and people know how to do this. It just hasn't been commercialized yet. So that, you know, there, a lot of work's already been done. Is, is, is the key thing. But with Uranium One, I mean, the issue was COVID hit uh, first, uh, and that sort of put a, a, a damper on our plans moving forward. And now we have this geopolitical situation where you know, Uranium One is, is a subsidiary of Ross Adam, the Russian state nuclear agency. Uh, and so geopolitically, it's just not really a viable path going forward. Um, so they're out of the picture. Um, but uh, again, between Vulcan, Lilac, and all the others that are involved in this, uh, those companies, I think, within the time frame of us being ready to use their technology, that that technology will be available. Because it already is there. The key fundamental uh, uh, aspects of this have already been known for many years. It's really the issue of just having it be commercialized. And there's so much money being pumped into it that I think it's pretty clear that, that something's going to pop out. I, you, you know better than anybody, Tim, uh, with your background that, uh, you know, these uh, commodities come in phases and or you should say come in cycles as well. But um, so we're really at an elevated price right now uh, for lithium, which is uh, driving these technologies. That price is going to be able to stay in there. So uh, it's going to be able to uh, continue to fund and allow something like uh, DLE come to the fore. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And and I think that there's a couple of key things you got to keep in mind. Um, lithium, traditionally lithium, well, lithium deposits, lithium source from brine deposits tend to be lower cost lithium than any other source of lithium there is out there, plus minus, as a group of assets. That's number one. So there's a lot more wiggle room for the lithium price to be volatile and you still make money and you're still secure in your operations if you have a brine operation. So that's number one. Number two is at least in all of the trials that I have seen, the real promise of sorption technology is that the cost is actually incredibly low. Um, so that, you know, it's not a question of this technology is great if only lithium prices were really high. It's a question of this technology is really great because it preserves the resource by not wasting water. That's been the main driver behind it. Uh, and that's really its genesis, frankly, in, in the first place. It's not so much that it's so much cheaper than everything else. It's that it preserves the water. Now, it turns out that the, the key variable in the cost of sorption technology is the cost of energy, because you're essentially pumping out water and you're running it through tanks. And then the question, the, the, real, the real key, the crux of sorption technology is getting that surface area interaction between your sorbent and the brine. I think it makes sense. The more surface area interaction there is, the more opportunity there is for the lithium to get pulled out of the brine onto the sorbent, right? This is where Uranium One has proven to have a, a much superior technology to date, is to basically have that interaction happen. The way other people, players, have managed to get that interaction happening is by heating up the water, basically agitating the water in a way so that there is more surface area interaction, but by heating up the water that requires energy. And that's where, you know, that's been the problem to date is the need, the cost of bringing energy to bear at the sorption tanks uh, to basically increase the surface area interaction between the brine and the sorbent. Um, so that the breakthrough is going to be, and is again, Uranium One has already achieved this, is if you can get the sorption area interaction higher, you need less energy than you would normally because that interaction, that interface between the brine and the sorbent is already happening. Does that, you know, so a lot of it has to do with the size of the sorbent and the shape of the sorbent. And also uh, the advantage of where you're actually located, depending on uh, how high concentrations yeah, you have in your brine yeah. within uh, your lithium as well, too, which I, I think that you're touting regarding well. Right, right, exactly. So, so um, yeah, that, that's, you know, that's, that's the main thing. And so, uh, you know, it's it, the question you asked to circle back to it is, is, is the lithium price going to stay high enough to basically make all of this work? And I think I've given you a very long-winded answer to the short answer, which is there is a lot of margin there to pay for sorption being being put into action. Let's talk about uh, where you're located. Uh, Chile is uh, going through uh, changes uh, to its uh, constitution that uh, could impact uh, what's happening in the resource space. Uh, there's also been uh, other, how would you say, uh, uh, roadblocks uh, for miners throughout the region. Um, what is it like uh, working in South America? Um, it has its challenges, for sure. Um, Argentina, 
where a lot of focus has been and, and been more successful to date as a country in terms of this is a much more federal government system where each region has a lot more autonomy as to what they do. Uh, and because of that, the immediacy of any particular project in a local region is much clearer to local management than it would ever be to you know, some sort of federal capital. Uh, and that has meant a lot more flexibility in Argentina, which has meant a lot more positive business support uh, for all of these projects. And so, as you well know, M&A activity in Argentina is just, you know, very high when it comes to what's happening in the lithium space. Chile is, is not like that. It's much more centralized. Um, and because it is much more centralized, uh, there is a larger disconnect between what the regions want to see happen and what Santiago sees and is responsive to. And that has led to things being a lot slower than they have been in Argentina. Um, the advantage to Chile, it is a very legal, legalistic framework jurisdiction. Um, and so, you know, the sanctity of title, um, the, the procedures you have to go through are very much set in stone. They're very clear to everyone and they're fair. The disadvantage is that because they're so set in stone, it's very hard to get anything done in any sort of efficient time frame. Everything takes a lot longer. Um, and so that that is where, you know, as a company, the challenge of working in Chile is that there is a process and a procedure that is is onerous. And, and for a junior miner on a limited budget, that can be a big problem. Whereas a larger company has a bigger budget that basically absorb the cost slash time to get through that process. Um, the flip side though, is that when you have a license in Chile, I mean, you know, you have it, nothing's going to happen to it. Um, you feel very, very secure in terms of title, in terms of um, uh, actually, you know, just not having that being an issue from a management point of view. The new constitution, um, I think I've, I've sort of answered that question, whereas because it is such a legalistic procedural place, I don't think the new constitution is really going to change much of anything in a bad way, which is what I think investors are concerned about. I think uh, there is enough checks and balances between different political forces in Chile that there is enough equilibrium that whatever new constitution pops out at the end of the cycle, it, that miners will be able to work within that legal framework without really any any sort of you know, surprises or problems. Tim, what's a lot of fun about uh, the battery metals uh, space is, is that everybody seems to be stepping out of their lane and every, it, you know, all the pieces are being thrown up in the air. I think it's Sabanya Stillwater and Jervok Global who are going downstream. They're buying refineries. You hear Tesla, you hear other majors that are actually talking about uh, becoming miners. Uh, Tim, what's going on? I can tell you that, that, multinational large corporations somewhere in some boardroom is we need lithium material for our plants. And then that gets delegated down to the lithium task force within the group. And that task force thing canvases around all of the lithium junior mining companies, which as you know, in the grand scheme of things, the market cap of the lithium space combined is, is very small. I mean, we're not a big industry. So they canvas around and they get everything and they say, okay, what do we want? We want a project that's in a good jurisdiction, that is bankable feasibility study stage, so we can deploy capital right away, and we want predictable time frame to supply. Now, I've had these conversations for years now, and, and it all boils down to one thing, which is what these companies want doesn't exist. <laughs> and so they are in a very uncomfortable situation. And up until I would say about last year, their answer to that was simply to ignore the problem and hope it went away. Uh, and I think right now they're finally realizing that they have to play an active role in something they don't want to do, which is incubate natural resource companies. Um, and the problem is just multiple tier. We talk about the lithium task force within a multinational. You can have a great conversation with them. They can understand everything. But at the end of the day, they'll tell you to say, look, I can't get a budget committee to give me money unless I can show them what they get. And if you're going to tell me that the budget is for drilling, I can't quantify what that means at the other end of that process. And therefore, if I can't quantify it, I can't get the, fu the funding up front. Um, and, and, and it's been a learning curve for everyone, certainly for the juniors. Um, uh, but I think we sort of caught on pretty quick. It's frankly, my concern from a very top down point of view is that the consumers of lithium are still, 
they're waking up, but they're still mostly asleep in, in terms of the situation. And it's not just lithium. It's pretty much everything, right? I mean, cobalt, lithium, and other battery metal projects. And so, yeah, they're in a very uncomfortable situation where um, they don't really understand what they're getting into. And, and they would like to ignore it and hope it goes away. And it's not. I mean, Elon Musk famously said, you know, lithium is it's like salt on a salad. And, you know, I always pointed out that the difference between salt on a salad and lithium in the car is that you, by definition, you can't have a lithium ion battery without lithium. I mean, it's not salt on a salad. There is no salad. Um, and, and it's that, that's a, that's just an example of sort of where this industry is vis-a-vis -vis its natural partners, which are the consumers of lithium. Lastly, Tim, um, milestones at uh, Wealth uh, Minerals uh, over the next 12 months. Uh, we're drilling right now in Iagwe, uh, which are parts of the north. Uh, those drill results, uh, together with some drill results that, frankly, we just acquired through a land acquisition, will be combined to come out with a resource. Uh, that resource will be the first step in quantifying our projects, uh, at least the one in, in Iagwe. The success we had with the local indigenous people in Iagwe, uh, we will use as a template to um, work together with the people in the Atacama area. Atacama is such a big asset in Chile that the, it, it, it's going to require a little more work and finesse to get everyone comfortable with what we're doing. Iagwe is, is, a, is a smaller town, much more remote. It just doesn't have the, the headline status that Atacama does. Uh, so resource on Iagwe, uh, uh, coming out with press releases showing our work with the indigenous people in Atacama and getting to work there. On the back of the resource, coming out with a scoping study type report on Ayagüe, so people can finally get some metrics around what it looks like. Uh, and in the process of all of that, given what we just discussed about the strategic situation, I would expect that the uh, strategic is probably going to step up to the plate, given the M&A activity in the sector as a whole and, and the dearth of assets available in the sector. Tim, thanks for speaking with Keiko. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. He's Tim McEwchin. He is Strategic Advisor at Wealth Minerals. My name is Michael McRae and you're watching Kiko Mining.